I am uh, looking for a motion to open the meeting. So moved. Moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Terrific. And um, we are um, missing Paul tonight, and uh, and we will see him again next month. Um, moving to the first item on the agenda, uh, are there any adjustments to this agenda, Annie? Yes. So we will, um, we have added this evening uh, the Town of Hadley Energy Reduction Plan um, that's been added to the agenda. Um, and we will, actually, we may not need to move the student representative introductions, um, but we will not have business manager reports this evening and we will not have an executive session this evening. And we may want to, I see you can make a determination. Uh, Mimi Kaplan from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, I think is joining us in the event that the school committee has any questions about the town of Hadley energy reduction plan. So certainly um, if you'd like, you could move that to right after public comment in the event that there are any questions, I would defer to the school committee on that. Great, thank you. We're gonna start off um, the meeting with public comment. As a reminder, public comment is, um, should be limited to three minutes and pertain to the items that are on the agenda. And um, if you're interested in making public comment, go ahead and raise your digital hand and we will take you off mute. <laughs> And I see one from Mimi. I'm going to ask you to unmute Mimi. Hi, yeah, I think someone just mentioned. I just hopped on because I, so I work for Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and I wrote the energy reduction plan. Um, for the town of Hadley. So I just wanted to come on in case um, anyone had questions at some point. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we will uh, call on you if there are questions at that time. Okay, thanks. Great. All right. Um, moving on to presentation and discussion items. Um, item A, introduction of Sarah Jaber, of the Safe Schools and DEI Specialist. Yes, yeah, so I'd like to introduce, we have hired a wonderful candidate, Sarah Jaber. She's uh, in the, you can see her in the gallery now. Sarah comes to us most recently from higher ed. She worked at Westfield State University in the admissions office. I will say that her resume speaks to somebody with uh, a breadth of knowledge and skills about a variety of topics. But one thing that really stood out for me when I spoke with Sarah's references um, to a person, they talked about not only her integrity and her hard work, but the fact that uh, Sarah does not wait to be in a position of positional authority uh, before she works to use her, her influence and her personal authority to make things better for people who um, may be maybe needing some help to advocate for themselves or to um, work within a system. So lots of folks had great things to say about her. She's somebody who's been engaged in her community, civically engaged, uh, and again, has all kinds of knowledge and skills. So we're thrilled to have her on board. And I wanna introduce her formally to the school committee and to our larger community. So welcome, Sarah. Terrific, thank you, Annie. Welcome, Sarah. It's great to have you on the team and we're excited to see you in this role. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. Terrific. All right, um, we're going to move on to the next item of the agenda, item B, approval of HPS fiscal year 24 preschool rates. And for that, we have Ms. Wenner on the line. Yes, we do. And the rates, oh, and a friend, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Hawk. Once I get home, she's like, right here. so she'll be fine. Um, so I will quickly share my screen. These are all pretty straightforward. Um, we usually stick to the 1.5% increase, which is right along with the cost of living increase. 
Um, so you can see where we were for this year and where we will be for next year. And the rates are rounded to the nearest quarter. So um, we do round up for the nearest quarter, but you can see our half day program, which is the 8.30 a.m. to 11.15 a.m. We still have the um, extended morning, which is um, the extra hour the children stay for lunch. So 8.30 a.m. till 12.15 p.m. And then the full day, 8.30 a.m. to 2.45 p.m. Um, and really, we're very competitive with all the other preschools in the area and the area daycares as well. So the rates are um, fair, I guess. Thank you, Ms. Wenner. Um, all three of my kids went to the pre uh, early childhood program. Um, it's a wonderful preschool and very, very affordable. Um, and I see that these increases um, keep it still at affordable rates in light of inflation and other uh, in other offerings. So um, thank you for this. Thank you. And so Annie, you need a vote from us. Terrific. So do I hear a motion to approve these um, new rates for the preschool tuition? So, so moved. And do I have a second? Seconded. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, um, we're moving on to fiscal year 24 budget update. We and are. And uh, the town has recommended uh, so far, the I should say the town, administer, town administrator and the treasurer have uh, recommended fully funding the request of the school department in fiscal year 24. So um, that is in the budget that the, that they presented or will be presenting to the select board that may have already happened when Joyce joins us. She can, at the end of the meeting, probably let you folks know if that happened. The short story is that it has been recommended as requested. We are very appreciative of the town's support as always. So thank you very much to the town of Hadley and the budget that we presented will be, it appears at this time, it's being recommended to go um, to town meeting floor. We do have a time set up with financial subcommittee with FinCom of the town uh, that will be on March 13th. Chris and I will be at FinCom and certainly Humera, if you're available for that meeting, that'd be Actually, wonderful. I think on March 13th, I am out of town, Annie. No worries. Chris okay. and I usually, it's very brief and there aren't a lot of, I, I don't believe that there are a lot of concerns about the present, the school department's request. So um, they still certainly may recommend some changes or requests that we alter something. But at this point in time, it looks like it's being recommended as presented. That's great news. Any questions for Annie about the budget? Okay. And um, I think Joyce is having a hard time getting in, just not, um, not but sure. we'll just keep persisting and adding her and uh, and hope that she's able to join by the end of the conversation. Okay, moving on to item D, the draft equity dashboard, Annie. Great. So let me share this, share, there we go. Am I doing that now? Can you see the screen? That yes. I'm Great. Okay. Let me move this over here so I can move through. So I really want to say thank you to the entire school committee, but particularly to the chair, Humera uh, Fasa Houdin, because this is something that she has um, had a laser like focus on. The entire school committee is absolutely committed to equity. That's evident in the fact that the school committee passed an anti -racist re racism resolution. Now it's been almost three years ago, I believe that you did that. Um, and has consistently asked for the administration, the leadership team to provide data on the extent to which all students are experiencing the values that we espouse as a community and as a school committee. So to what extent are our students and our families and our staff and our educators experiencing an environment that appreciates diversity, that fosters equity and inclusion, and um, 
and also uh, promotes diversity. So at the school committee's recommendation and, and joyfully, the leadership team was happy to engage in this work. We asked ourselves what data, what kinds of metrics might we look at in order to answer those overarching questions to what extent are all students experiencing and achieving the values and the commitments and goals that we espouse? And those values, commitments, and goals can be found in some of the documents I referenced, the School Committee Anti-Racism Resolution, our school and district strategy documents. And as we look at the data, then we ask ourselves, you know, what questions and ideas emerge regarding the extent to which policies and practices and conditions foster or inhibit diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging for all of our students. We arranged the data, we organized the data rather um, aligned, uh, aligned with four topic areas. And these fo focus areas were intentionally aligned to our strategy documents. Um, so one is looking at deep challenging learning opportunities for all students. What did, the, what did the data suggest about the extent to which that's a reality? What does the data suggest about the extent to which safe and supportive learning environments are something that all students experience? To what extent do we have find meaningful and mutually supportive relationships among students and among students and staff? And to what extent does our district uh, employ a highly qualified and diverse workforce. We, the first set of data that we looked at um, had to do with enrollment and demographics. Now you'll see that we have enrollment data, we have achievement data, we have data about discipline and behavior, um, and we have data about uh, faculty and the demographic characteristics and the qualifications of faculty and staff. The reason that we started with demographic data is because diversity is a value that we espouse. And so rather than just saying that, or this is something that we aspire to, we wanna ask ourselves, well, to what extent, how, how well are we doing on that in terms of encouraging uh, diversity, appreciating diversity and creating environments that um, people from all kinds of backgrounds want to participate in and be a part of. In public schools, our enrollment is dependent upon, there's only two paths in public schools. Either you live in town, resident member enrollment, or you participate through school choice. The reason that I included the 2020 census data for Hadley is to demonstrate that the schools actually are much more diverse than the town itself. The town of Hadley is almost 89% white, whereas in the district, um, the population is closer to 75%. Um, so our schools are more diverse than the community from which they draw, which does indicate something about the effectiveness of the school choice program in terms of diversifying our community, which is wonderful. And not only does our school choice program attract students from diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds, but we also attract people with very, um, who are neurotypically divergent. Um, we attract students uh, who have individual education plans. We attract families of varying income backgrounds. Um, and um, we also attract families, albeit not as much, uh, of students who are English language learners. The data, we have the data for the district and we also provide data on each school. So the first section of that equity dashboard is simply designed to help people understand who, who, who are the students who are attending Hadley Elementary School and to what extent do they reflect the community um, where the schools are located. And as I said, in this case, the school community is more diverse than the community from which um, it primarily draws its students. After we looked at enrollment, we asked ourselves questions about the extent to which students, all students had access to deep learning or um, you know, challenging and rigorous learning experiences. One of the metrics that we look at, at are is in, at enrollment data in students enrolled in advanced coursework. And what you see in each one of these sections is 
a hyperlink to the data that we looked at. So in this case, it takes you directly to a report that's on the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's website. In some cases, there's also some research in case people understandably ask the question, well, why is this important? Why, why do we care who's taking what courses? What does this mean? So there is some research to support the fact that students who take advanced coursework are far more likely to enroll in post-secondary and to succeed in post-secondary. And there's also a link that defines what exactly constitutes advanced coursework. What we have seen, my computer's slow to scroll at the moment. First, I will say when you're looking at this graph, people are wondering, why don't we see 2023? That's the year that we're in right now. So I intentionally took the data directly from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's website. So there is a lag time because they, they takes them a while to get the data that we currently have for our students right now. And you can see that we have seen a decrease, a slight decrease in all students um, from 21 to 22 in all students who have completed advanced coursework and a much more significant decrease in students who qualify under the state category of economically disadvantaged or who fall, who qualify as high needs. In order to be considered a student in the category of high needs, the state defines that as a student who is, can be more than one of the, these things, but at, is at least in at least one of these groups, which is economically disadvantaged or low income, a student with disabilities or an English language learner. They may have more than, they may be in multiple groups, but if they're in one of those groups, they are considered a student who qualifies as high needs by the state. So we do notice a more precipitous drop off for students who qualify as economically disadvantaged and students who qualify as high needs, completing advanced coursework between 21 and 22. My plan is to go through each section of this and then certainly to allow the, the school committee to ask questions, to provide feedback. Um, so if it's all right, I'll just go through it and then open it up for questions. The next data set that we looked at is called the Early Warning Indicator System. The early warning indicator system is something that the state, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education created. And they created this system as a way of identifying students who, if they did not receive additional support or they did not receive specific kind of evidence-based interventions, um, they would not be likely to meet academic milestones. So they define specific academic milestones for each grade band. And then they look at the likelihood, is it high, moderate, or low, that a student would not meet an important academic milestone. Um, and so students who are at low risk of not meeting an academic milestone, I'm sorry, is this really happening with my cats right now? Could you go over there? Thanks. Um, for students who are at low risk of not making, meeting an academic milestone, um, so 90% of the students who are at low risk will meet this. So only 10% are not going to meet the milestone if they're in the low risk category. In the moderate risk category, 60% um, of students at moderate risk will meet the academic milestone, so 40% would not. And at the high risk, 25% of students at high risk will meet the academic milestone for their cohort, meaning 75% of the students would not. What we do see when we look at this data set, let me open this up. When we look at the data set for the early warning indicator system, what we're looking for is over and under representation. So we notice for each row, it gives you the demographic group or the group, the selected population for, of students, the number, and the percent of students that fall in each risk category. So for all students, you see that 22% of all students are at high risk for not meeting academic milestones. Um, however, 43% of African-American or Black students are at high risk, 31% of Asian, 25% of Hispanic, Latino, 
20% of white students. So we see that white students mirror what's happening in the aggregate. We see overrepresentation among other ethnic groups. We also see overrepresentation among certain selected populations, high needs, low income, English learners, former English learners, students with disabilities. So in our selected populations, we also see overrepresentation. This is going to be a challenge for me to hold on. I'm going to pause share so I can just get back to where I need to go for a second. Sorry. One second. There we are. Thanks for being patient. Here we go. All right. After looking at the early warning indicator system, you can see some of these graphs are just graphs that take the numerical data I just showed you in the spreadsheet and place them in a chart. Um, we also looked at our MCAS data. Now, MCAS certainly isn't the sole or even primary indicator that we use to evaluate the effectiveness of our instructional programs. As you know, we're a school district that does universal screening in literacy and in mathematics and in behavioral health three times a year. And based on that screening data, we create intervention groups and do progress monitoring. It's important to remember when we think back to the data that we just looked at. Again, a student is at high risk and that assumes they're at high risk if they receive no intervention. So we are a district that through universal screening and progress monitoring that we always ensure that students, when screening data indicates to us that students are at risk of not meeting academic or instructional milestones, we are very quick to provide interventions for students and not just in academics, but also in behavioral health. However, MCAS is an important um, indicator because certainly it does have an impact. Ultimately, students do need to meet expectations on MCAS if they want to receive a diploma. So we do see um, over and under representation in our 2022 MCAS results in English language arts. Um, we particularly, we can see this with students with disabilities. Um, we can also, um, see this when we go down to race and ethnicity categories. We see overrepresentation of students not meeting expectations among African American and Black students um, and overrepresentation among Hispanic and Latino students as well as compared to all students. Uh, we see some overrepresentation um, when we look at gender and MCAS performance, with some slight overrepresentation among male students. And when we look, my apologies, I believe you're now looking at math. I have to change the title on that. Um, and again, um, we see overrepresentation among students with disabilities in not meeting expectations. And uh, overrepresentation again by race and ethnicity, African American, Black students, Hispanic, Latino students. We see overrepresentation in the percentage of students not meeting expectations. We see less discrepancy in mathematics when it comes to gender. When we look at our screening data, we see some similar discrepancies when it comes to uh, race and ethnicity with um, an overrepresentation uh, among, for the most part among non-white students. Now, if you're asking why in this case we don't have as much of a breakdown, it's because there were so few students. If there were too few students in a particular ethnic category, I had to bring them I had to put them together. Otherwise, in some of our charts, it would almost result in becoming identifying in some of the numerical charts that I had to create. Um, 
So here we also see overrepresentation by in certain ethnic groups in high risk categories. Um, we see the same thing happening with our fluency data. We look at our growth data. We're looking at flat growth. Again, we see overrepresentation among um, Asian students, African American, and Black students. Um, and similarly, fall to winter growth data in our fluency measures. Those kind of buckets of data had to do primarily with rigorous and challenging learning environments and access and outcomes that relate to academics. When we look at safe and supportive learning environments, we primarily uh, are looking at our behavioral, behavior and disciplinary data. Um, so what you find in these charts, actually, I'm sorry, I'm gonna do this differently. I'm gonna, ah, this drives me nuts. This drives me nuts. Sorry again, I gotta stop one second because I cannot seem to get the right screen up. So I appreciate you being so patient. No worries, Annie. Thank you for taking us through it in detail. Appreciate it. So rather than clicking over to the, um, the spreadsheet, so within the equity dashboard, wherever you see a link, you can click on those. And frequently the charts that you're looking at are embedded in a spreadsheet that you can access, but that way you can also look at the numbers, like where are the numbers coming from and the formulas that are used to to arrive at these percentages. I have gotten some very good and important feedback on the two charts I'm going to show you right now. And to summarize the feedback, it is, those are kind of horrible charts are really hard to figure out what you're trying to say. <laughs> and that Because our principals did a wonderful job of having our faculty and staff look at the equity dashboard and did what's, and in both buildings, they did something called a wonder and notice protocol. And this overwhelmingly was a, what is this saying? So also some of the feedback I'm looking for from the committee, and it doesn't all have to come this evening. You can email me over time is to say, yikes, I'd probably format that a little differently. But what, you're, what I'm trying to communicate to you in these charts is in blue is quarter one. Feedback I've already received is it'd be helpful if quarter one was all together. When you look at percent of enrollment, that's percent of total student enrollment. So at Hopkins Academy, um, I am going to, I'm going to skip down to, um, I'm going to skip down to students with IEPs. So at Hopkins Academy, quarter one, 12% of the enrollment of the total student enrollment. Now I'm going to take you to the next blue column, which yes, I do need to put all the blue columns together. So we're going to hop over to the next blue column, uh, students with IEPs, but percent of all referrals. So what that means is total number of disciplinary infractions. A, a, one student may have multiple infractions. So this is a count of all disciplinary infractions. So of all disciplinary infractions, students with IEPs, about 31% of all disciplinary infractions. Percent of students with referrals. Now, if I just do a head count of every student who has a disciplinary referral, that's a percent of the total number of students. So there we see, if we're looking at over and under representation. So 12% of the population, about 17% of all students with referrals, about 31% of all referrals. Similar, um, when we look at uh, Hadley Elementary, you'd read the chart the same way. I'll take um, the same line, students uh, with individual education plans, 23% of population in quarter one and quarter two, 5% of all referrals, almost 8% of students with referrals. So another 
These data sets help us say where do we see over and under representation um, in both schools in terms of discipline. Our special education data by race, ethnicity, gender, and school. Um, I am not going to, because I have to keep then stop screen sharing, but I will say that something that that was a big aha moment for the leadership team and even as the faculty and staff looked at this, if you click on the hyperlink there and you see the spreadsheet, our, the data around gender and students who have qualified for special education, it, it looks like the, the Commonwealth at large, um, but it is, it is curious. So about 75% of students with IEPs are boys and about 25% are girls. Um, and the population does not, that is not the population breakdown in the district to, or in either school. It's, it's roughly 50-50. I mean, slightly, it's roughly 50-50. So that is something that we've been talking about and looking at and asking ourselves, what, what might that be about? What might be going on there? Um, and the focus area three, your, the data here, uh, Sarah and I will be finalizing the timeline. Tomorrow we'll finalize the timeline for survey administration. And this is where we will include the survey data that we'll be collecting from families and staff and students about the extent to which they feel as though schools are equitable, diverse, inclusive, and they feel a sense of belonging. That data will be added there, it's not there now. And so when my, my plan is that at a minimum for the school committee that you would see these data annually at my formative evaluation and the summative evaluation, you may even do it three times. We may revisit it before we finalize the district strategy document. Um, each year, the priorities for each year, we may want to look at these data and say, okay, we're making sure that we're addressing some of these things that we see in the actions that we are prioritizing for the upcoming year. So you will see the data, you, you may see the survey data prior to my summative evaluation in June, but you will see all these data at least twice a year from me, um, and uh, if not three times a year for setting the strategy document. The last section has to do with the highly qualified and diverse workforce. So we wanna know the extent to which our educators are highly qualified, something that can happen um, and does happen nationally is that students who are um, part of selected populations, so students with disabilities, students from whose families qualify as low income or students who are non-white, not white, frequently across the country are more likely to have educators who are not considered highly qualified. Good news in Hadley, 98.1%, the vast majority. So highly qualified means that a teacher is teaching, uh, possesses a license for the subject which they are teaching. The reason every single one of our teachers are certified, they're certified in our subject area, the only reason we don't make 100% on that is because in some cases, there may be an elective that a teacher is teaching that their, um, that their, their license is not an exact match for. So um, we're doing quite well there. We do see that in our educator workforce, the extent, the question, the extent to which, to, to what extent does our educator workforce reflect our students? And that's a place where we have a ways to go. Um, there are, sometimes people wonder why is this so important? So we have linked in there some of the research that, that tells us why um, it's important to make sure that we have a representative workforce. Um, and so in 21-22, 92% of Hadley public school teachers were white compared to 76% of the student population. And I've also provided all the links where people can look over these data historically if they would like. So this is just the beginning. 
our goal in putting this together is not to say, and now we have all the answers and we know exactly what to do. If we knew exactly what to do, we would have prevented disparity from occurring in the first place. However, um, we believe strongly that uh, you can't effectively solve any problem that you haven't precisely defined and you can't define a problem that you were unaware of. So first we have to know what's happening and we have to consistently look at what's happening and then are ask ourselves, what conditions do we think might be exacerbating the conditions that we observe? What might we do differently in order to get our desired outcomes? But what's most important is to be clear about what are the outcomes we desire and then be honest and look at and what are we actually seeing? Um, and so I've said that we as a leadership team uh, worked hard together to, to pull this together. Any of the, the lack of attractiveness in presentation is mine and mine alone. The, um, and the principals, as I've said, did a notice and wonder protocol. So they had their faculty go through this and look at what did they notice and what did they wonder. And they can certainly speak to um, what they learned from that and how they intend on using these data going forward and in their planning. Um, and I welcome any comment or feedback and the entire team also is here, of course, to answer any questions that people might have. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Great, thank you, Annie. Um, I really wanna commend you on um, pulling together this um, exhaustive look um, at the parameters that um, make up our equity dashboard. Um, this is something, as you mentioned, I've been asking for for a while, and I'm just, it's uh, its so nice to see it come to fruition. Um, and thank you for um, your team members who worked with you to pull together the data. Um, and prettiness is not what we're going for, but what you uh, surfaced are things that uh, definitely make us take pause and, and question. I have a lot of questions and I'm still digesting this data and will be for um, several weeks, but I'm very curious. Um, my, my one question is how did the faculty um, and staff receive the information? How did the uh, notice and wonder protocols go? Uh, April and, and Jen. Sure, I can start if that's okay with April. Um, we were really fortunate to receive this information in draft form prior to tonight's meeting. And uh, we were just thankful to have a staff that came together and really, just like we're doing tonight, be presented with a lot of information that covers a lot of different components. And so um, the Notice and Wonder Protocol went very well at my staff meeting. We did it in early February. Um, as a staff, we all broke off into groups and um, kind of tackled the information. There was some helpful feedback. Um, and at, at first, I do have to say that this, this was a heavy lift, and it was mostly done by Dr. McKenzie. Um, we definitely gave some feedback and some support, but this was really, this is a lot of information that she tackled. Um, and we helped as much as we could along the way, but it really was um, this, this complete document is um, really just, uh, it's, it was her work. And so we're, we're helpful and I'm grateful to be working with her around this. The staff was wonderful. Um, they looked at this information. We're going to continue to look at this information. It's not going to be a one and done type thing. Um, we absolutely are going to use this to drive how we look at student data, look at uh, discipline data, look at what we're doing at, at the elementary school, um, not only as a whole group of a student body, but also using this information for individual students um, and really making sure that we're, we're constantly looking at the student need. And um, so I, I, it's just the first step. It's a great first step. Um, I'm thankful to have this information. Um, and we'll be building and, and continuously having conversations about how we need to support students. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Jen. Um, so I guess I have some similar feedback in terms of the Hopkins staff. Some of these sets of data 
are already ones that they review in departments or that I review with the leader t- leadership team throughout the year. What's really nice uh, that Annie mm-hmm. did was put it all together, obviously one place for the public to see as well. So she already very kindly provides us all with those MCAS charts to take a look at and have conversations about at the beginning of the year. And so when staff get together and do that, they took a look at um, any of those discrepancies there and come up with those intervention plans of what to do. So in terms of what was sort of newer for them to look at and that they had, I think, more questions about because they're not as familiar with it was looking at some of that enrollment in demographic data. Um, So they had some conversations there about, you know, what that meant and how it compared to the town. And I think, you know, some realizations about some of our school choice numbers, which were really interesting. Um, And then the referral data, there was some confusion in general about, you know, the charts and what it means. and, And even that, you know, I think it's important for people to remember too that just because a referral is put in does not necessarily mean that there is an exact like disciplinary consequence. So especially at Hopkins, there's multiple levels and teachers will record those. So even if it's a teacher conference for an action or a parent email. Um, so, and obviously we can't necessarily put all the, the action end into these charts as well. Um, And so I think for them, that this year in both here, sort of as the bigger picture is new for people and our uh, tier two PBIS team and our middle school grade level teams have been working more and they, uh, of course, get to see a little more specific information. But I think helping people to see those discrepancies in that data, even if there is varying levels of what those actions are, I think that raised a lot of questions for them. And the last piece was um, data that the faculty had actually looked at before. So at the end, I know Annie was talking about the Panorama survey, but Hopkins had a survey from 2021. However, our student services department was the one who looked at that during our notice and wonder protocol. And most, most to almost all of those people are new. And so they had not had the opportunity to take a look at that feedback there. And they had some really great questions and thoughts, especially about some of the places that students were identifying as problematic and challenging and where they might um, hear discriminatory statements and had a lot of questions about whether that was still being reflected and what we could do and a desire to have uh, updated information. And so they were quite glad to hear that that's something that we're going to be getting some more information about as well. Um, and of course, there were some, you know, little things about what does this chart mean and how does that add up and, and all of that fun stuff. Uh, but in in general, I think those were the areas where they had some more feedback, the, you know, the enrollment coursework and the MCAS data and those types of pieces they see pretty um, frequently throughout the year. Great. I'm really glad to have uh, both uh, buildings, uh, educators weighing in on uh, the way they're collecting data and how we strengthen this dashboard for future iterations um, so that it is actionable and useful. Um, Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call on Christine. Christine, you've had your hand up. I'm just going back to the disciplinary. I I apologize. I had my dog uh, trying to get my attention when I when you mentioned some of the students are it the repeat offenders so that you're that's included in the numbers or not included yeah so the and i'm also i'm also really glad that that april that you brought up that distinction to that a referral does not mean a disciplinary outcome necessarily so it's, i just I have to say that out loud as i'm improving on this to make things clearer percent of all referrals christine is total number of referrals. So that could be, so you could have duplicate student count in there. A student could have multiple referrals. Percent of students with referrals, no duplicate students, just a head count of any student who's had a referral. So So both are reported. Yeah, so both are reported, correct. And Annie, to your point about um, uh, the referral terminology being inclusive of, uh, of, discipline as well as other any any kind of referral to, to you know have a parent teacher conference or, or what have you I think it becomes important then to uh, make sure we're capturing 
the right things throughout the year and uh, to make sure that we're specific uh, in in how we're capturing it so that we can report out with fidelity um, for the things that we want to track. I know one of the questions I had, um, which I guess I would encourage you guys to think about, obviously in a small school is challenging because the more specific you are, the more identifying it can be. With the teachers, they get to see those referral codes, they see the action codes, they see particular students so that, you know, we can identify, is there like a grade level problem, a class problem, particular students? Um, are there challenging relationships between people? Are there, you know, even for example, 25% of all referrals are cell phones. So that's obviously a different kind of problem than a bias incident. Uh, the question I raised though was for the public, the more specific we get in some of those areas, it can become less confidential. Um, and so that's where I'm sort of left struggling with that because I think some of that information is certainly important, but then when you present that publicly, you sort of can have those other challenges. So that was you know, one of the pieces where I was really struggling with that. I thank you, uh, Annie, for weighing the consequence of collecting the data in granularity and reporting out in aggregate. I think if you were to take this same chart that you're going to move the columns around and so that it's a little bit more readable by quarter, um, I, I don't know that being more specific on referrals would actually be, give, give me any identifiable information, but uh, but I thank you for going down that path and just trying to make sure that we're getting data that we can trust um, and be like, oh, this is not all parent-teacher conferences um, because it just casts away mm -hmm. that there may be uh, it, any issue at all. And, uh, and we don't want that to happen. At, in Hadley, at Hadley Elementary School, we're really working and would like to work on calibrating what does a refer referral look like across because we have from kindergarten to grade six. And so we have all these referral codes, which our staff recognize this is only, we're only a couple of years in actually using what Hopkins uses. We used to use a paper referral form. And so now everything is streamlined on school brains. So the staff did, um, you know, many staff members came to me and said, we would love to have an exercise of, you know, what, what are we writing up? What does it look like? Um, what are the next steps? And so we're still starting that process, but I think that this is a, the great conversations that we're having will hopefully lead us there. Indeed. Um, I'm gonna ask my other school com committee colleagues whether they have questions, Tara, Ethan, um, there's quite a bit of special education and IEP related data in there. I'm, I'm sure your, mm -hmm. your uh, mind is going as well, looking at this data. I'm curious to get your thoughts. Um, so I, I think I have to go and digest it more as well. I had kind of questions as we were going through and I, I think I was trying to look at the bigger picture rather than hone in on you know, specifics, but I had a lot of thoughts and questions as I'm going through. And I think what I may do is as I'm reading through it again, um, maybe ask some specific questions of, of Annie in particular. Um, I hear you on, and I, I agree with you, Humera, on, you know, being able to present the aggregate um, information to us so that we're able to get a good broad overview of where things stand. Um, and I guess my only like overarching question is, is kind of like, you know, um, as far as administration goes, like, what are the talks for next steps? What what do the action items look like? How often will um, the leadership team be meeting, um, both as a group and then with individual teachers um, to discuss how we're going to improve this? And then, you know, that expectation, too, is that teachers are able or administration is able to look at this on um, a much more focused view to ensure that if it is a continued problem quarter by quarter, year by year with particular students versus a grade level, maybe. I mean, this, this information could just be broken down in so many different ways over the years, right? As you're, as you're collecting more and more data, th this is just such a wealth of information that you're gonna have available 
um, to really look at and review. And so I think long term, it's going to be really helpful um, to be able to, to narrow it down. But I guess I'm just curious, just broad overall next steps. We've got this wonderful plethora of information available to us. Now, what are we going to, what are we going to do with it? What are the most logical first steps? Where do we start? Right? Because now we're looking at um, disparities in ethnicity and disparities in special education. And how do you break it down? Where do you start? Um, and what do you do? I don't know if you guys have already started thinking about that, how often you're going to meet, what you're going to do with it, how often this information is going to be updated um, for us to review, for you guys as yourself to review, um, and next steps. Sure. I can tackle some of that. And then certainly um, April, Jen, or Celia, specific to their departments, are, are welcome to to chime in as well. So the broad view, how frequently the dashboard itself would be updated. As I said, you'd see updates on that dashboard that I would anticipate I would be sharing with the school committee at a minimum twice a year and most likely three times a year, although it's unlikely that there'd be big changes from my summative evaluation in June until September, maybe some slight enrollment changes, minor things, when we're looking at establishing priorities for the upcoming year. So you would see September, we're establishing priorities for the upcoming year and seeing to what extent we need to revise our district strategy document mid-year around the time of my formative evaluation. So how are we making, um, that's actually someone's cell phone in my house that is a cat noise. This can't be my life right now. I don't know where it is and I can't turn it off. So eventually. <laughs> Uh, so, and then mid-year, we will do a formative, you'll do my formative evaluation, and that'll be a good time to remind me of, um, to make sure that the entire public is seeing this. And then again, in June for my summative evaluation. And uh, in terms of the leadership team, we have been in the development of this, we've been talking about this, we meet weekly, with the district leadership team, so that would be the building principals, April and Jen, Celia, myself, Michelle, and Sarah now to uh, look at these data and talk about what exactly are we doing. Big next plans. Let me back up one thing on this. One thing that we have been doing as a district, uh, Tara, and for everybody is that, and this is a gift of being a very small district, for example, that early warning indicator system data. So we get that and we get, we look at that at the student level. That's how we can see it. We say every single student name in every single one of those categories. And the first thing in the high risk category is we say, is every or is every single one of these students on someone's radar? And what are the supports and interventions that they're receiving? And what is the progress monitoring plan for that particular student so that we know whether or not the intervention is having its desired effect? We do a similar act. Michelle leads all the work that happens three times a year with universal screening, literacy, numeracy, behavioral health. The student is showing up as somebody that needs help in anything, academically or emotionally. We look at the individual student level. And then in this case, it's not just leadership team. I'm at a broader view of is, is every single student who's identified as having um, in need of, of additional support. Have we, do we know who they are? What's the plan? How are we monitoring the plan? When will we check back to see if it did what the plan did what it was supposed to do? Then at the building levels, the principals and Michelle lead that work with classroom teachers, the individual level. Um, at the broader district level, there clearly are some of this over and under representation data and the teachers themselves have asked for additional uh, training and professional development and, and support in working effectively with students from a broad range of backgrounds. So in March, we've had various professional developments. Our principals have um, facilitated some conversations. We've uh, had uh, folks either watch kind of training videos, have small group discussions, have book discussions, have facilitated dialogues. In March, we will have a, a person come in and present and take our entire district staff through cultural proficiency and being culturally proficient educators. At Hopkins Academy, uh, April staff, the first cohort 
uh, the kind of like, I don't know what we're calling that group, April, you have a name for it, of folks uh, who will get the first round of restorative justice training. And she has the plan for the entire going into next year of how we'll build out restorative justice training across all of the faculty and staff. Um, so those are some concrete things that are coming up right now. And um, are there other, do you have other questions, Tara? Did I answer your question? No, I think you answered it enough. Again, I think this is like a lot of information and the overarching goal is how do we close that gap, right? How do we make it more equal? And I've, I've said it before, you know, I'm always thankful for our leadership team and I just I'm specifically going to call out, I'm really thankful for Michelle's role and now Sarah's role um, to be able to, you know, the principals have this overarching, right? They're looking at the entire schools, but then we've got these two people who are really able to give a fine lens on two completely different areas. Um, and I'm really excited for you, um, Sarah, to have just started here and offer your unique perspective and your expertise in this area. I think it really gives had me this really wonderful advantage to not only take these concerns, but um, really bring these concerns um, um, to light and then do something about it and, and, and make positive changes. And I have every, every uh, faith in all of you that, that we'll be able to see some positive changes in our school for all these students where there are disparities and make the environment um, much more comfortable um, for all of our students to be in. So I'm excited to see, um, Sarah, what you're gonna gonna add to the to the district as well. So again, welcome and thank you, Annie. And if I have any additional specific questions, I may just reach out. Thank you, Tara. Um, Ethan, we haven't heard from you. Christine, I know you have a question. Uh, can I'll just say real quick, I, I just appreciate Tara for asking all the questions that I just mm -hmm. asked or I was going to ask, but I do wanna just say thank you to all of you for all of this work, but also the fact that all of you showed up here tonight. Um, I think that's also kind of a sign of your commitment to the school, to the community, to the work that we're trying to do. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of information here to digest. I'm just looking forward to getting into it. Thanks, Ethan. Christine. I was just gonna ask about um, the data for the high school and in terms of discipline referrals, uh, can you separate that out between middle school and high school? I'm just curious how that would work, you know, or wh what that would show only because yeah. Uh, miss, you know, middle school is a different level and maturity and um, transition. So I was just curious. We absolutely, uh, we absolutely can. Um, yeah, middle and high school. We can't on, you said specifically behavior. I can't on, uh, well, MCAS has to be three through eight because mm -hmm. our, our numbers yeah. are so small, but, um, but definitely on behavior, we can break down behavior. and. Uh, Great. Yeah. Terrific. Once again, thank you, Annie. This was a huge lift. I think it'll be easier to fine tune and uh, refresh. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really uh, uh, glad to hear that the conversations um, have started and are um, uh, tracking uh, in asking all the right questions and uh, mm -hmm. surfacing what might be going on here. Um, before we end on this topic, I'd like to move up an aspect of the agenda um, that we had till later, and that was to introduce our student representatives, because I'd love to get their feedback and perspective uh, on this as well. So we have with us tonight, and Andy, you should do the proper integration uh, introduction, but I'm so thrilled to see Priscilla Cruz and Grant Donovan on the line. Can you tell us a little bit about, about them and introduce them? I To tell you about them, wonderful. First of all, <laughs> I ask them for help and they just step up and help. So wonderful natural born leaders. They participated in the student group that helped us with our interviews for the Safe School Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Specialist position that now Sarah holds. Um, Grant, uh, many of you may recall that in a superintendent newsletter a while ago, Grant and I attended, because Grant and Priscilla both participated in an intergroup dialogue uh, kind of 
training and experience at Hopkins Academy. And then Grant uh, also attended a conference, a youth conference. Now, Grant, I'm forgetting the name of the conference. But all I remember that I put in the newsletter was an award-winning author was giving a talk and Grant's question, the author said it was it essentially it sung Grant's praises about what an intelligent and insightful question it was. And um, I, was, I was really impressed, really proud to be in Grant's company. Priscilla also a leader and committed to making Hopkins Academy a wonderful and inclusive place. She has a tremendous amount of energy. She's wicked smart. I say wicked now. I've been in Massachusetts for 25 years, so now I say that. And um, and a hard worker. And they can tell you a little bit about themselves. And certainly if they have any questions on any of the presentations, they can ask those as well. Thank you both for being here. Priscilla and Grant. Yeah, please. Uh, we'd love to... You know, your student voice is really incredibly important, and we've had it very inconsistently over the last uh, several years, but it turns out that it's actually state law to have student representatives on the um, school committee and to be having um, uh, frequent uh, and real dialogue and input. And especially on this topic uh, that is near and dear to my heart, I'm very interested in getting both your feedback on what you see as students. Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to introduce myself first. Obviously, uh, you heard my name is Priscilla. I'm in 10th grade. Um, I do a bunch of, I do like drama club. I do, I'm part of art workshop. Um, both are kicking my butt right now, <laughs> especially drama club because we're, we're getting close to performance day. So that's, I'm super excited about that. Um, I also like to think that I see a lot of the, not all the time, but a lot of the time um, me and a lot of people who feel comfortable talking to me will come to me with a lot of concerns with how the student body is, whether that be, um, you know, they're concerned about some divisions that they're seeing or just you know things like that it tends to happen and I'm really lucky to have people who are very open and honest and willing to talk to me about stuff like that um yeah and I hope that I can offer some different perspectives and a different and some a couple of ideas to make the student body as a whole more able to get their voices heard because in general, it's, it's kind of hard to know where to start when you have concerns. You're like, do I tell do I tell the principal? Do I tell the teacher? Do I tell my parents? Like, what is the order? So um, I want to see if I can help make the student body a little bit more capable of reaching out and knowing where to start. Um, yeah. <laughs> Grant, you can go ahead. Well, so, first, uh, you're at the right place. And uh, there, there is uh, always a perceived chain of command, but uh, your voice here amongst us is as an equal. And so we welcome all thoughts um, uh, unfiltered um, so that we can uh, really serve you. We are here to serve you. So thank you for that, Grant. Oh, hi, my name is Grant. I'm a sophomore and I'm not in any clubs right now. I have a varsity sport in fall and a varsity sport in winter, so I don't really have time for clubs, but usually I do join a club or like continue being in a club for spring. Um, I'm excited to be able to help the student body have a voice, like Priscilla said, and to help um, make changes where they need to be changed. Um, I'm just excited to have this position, so thank you. Thank you. All right, great. Um, are there any final thoughts or comments on the equity dashboard before we wrap up this topic and move on? Can I just make um, a quick hello and thank you to both Priscilla and Grant. I haven't seen you guys in a couple of years. Um, I can't believe you're in 10th grade. 
<laughs> it's been a long time, but we they're great, great kids and happy to see you here. Terrific. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to the next item of the agenda. And that is item E, approval of school choice program and slots for 2023-2024. And there's an action item associated with this. Annie, do you want to take us through that? I do. And I also want to say, just remind uh, the administrators, I know that uh, the administrators, some of them have young children at home. Everyone gets up early, although you may not have to get up that early tomorrow, but I'm not 100% sure yet. I'll find out when I'm done with this meeting and I look at the news. Um, so certainly I would ask April, everybody is always welcome to stay for the entire meeting. I would ask April and Jen just to stay for school choice in case there's questions, but I didn't want anyone else to feel badly if they have uh, family obligations or childcare or anything else. Um, so school choice, this is linked into your agenda. What I tried to do is um, give you each grade. So the incoming class is essentially moving up. Uh, who's currently sitting in, uh, in, in kindergarten has moved up to first grade. And then you can see that Jen Dowd is looking at class sizes of 20 is, is her goal there. So you can see based on the incoming class, how many choice seats she's recommending. And for grades seven through 12, the enrollment we're looking at is 55 and Please tell me I got that right, April. And if I didn't, I can edit it right now on the fly. Is it 55 or should those read 50? 50? 55 is correct. Okay. So the school committee has to vote annually to A, just participate in school choice. And then we vote on the numbers as presented unless the school committee is in disagreement with those. Then once we've done that, we can start uh, opening up the slots, people are already turning in applications for school choice, families are. And what we do then is we set a deadline. The deadline will probably be the end of March, no later than the beginning of April. Um, and at that time, all those families who've applied, if there are sufficient seats, would be notified that they were accepted into the school choice program. If we had more families apply than we had available seats, so if you take a look at, for example, uh, first grade, There'd be three seats available. If we had five families apply, we literally draw out of a hat. That's the law. That D watches me put the names in a hat and pull them out. Terrific. Thank you. And um, I think it was the week before last, I had an opportunity to make a, um, a quick presentation and announcement to the um, at the senior center. And uh, they had had a... They, there was a question that came up. It was coffee with the cop. And they asked the cop, how are things going at the schools? Um, specifically with respect to various incidents as of late. And so I took the opportunity after making that announcement to just say things are going well at the schools. Um, and they took that opportunity to put me up at the front of the room and have uh, be like coffee with the school committee chair uh, for the next uh, 20 minutes. But the number one thing on everyone's mind was school choice. And I was really surprised there was such little information about what that is and why we do it. And so I thought we would just take a moment for the viewing public to know that um, each district in the state has the ability to uh, to have their school committee members vote to participate in school choice. Now, why would a district like Hadley vote to participate in school choice? Well, for one thing, we are a small district and there are a number of Hadley students that over the course of the years have wanted to um, uh, be on the swim team or take Mandarin or you know get a wider breadth of classes as would be offered at Amherst or Northampton. And uh, they would not be able to leave for those districts if we did not vote for school choice. And so first and foremost, it's providing our Hadley students with options. Uh, that said, we've had far fewer Hadley students who have left Hadley and chosen to stay in Hadley. Um, and so our numbers um, have been trending really positively in that direction uh, in light of the fact that we're a great school system and we have, we, we punch above our weight, we offer many things. And uh, so not only 
um, are fewer students leaving, but the spots that are made available by students leaving, we're able to fill with students from other districts coming to our town. And as you heard earlier, enriching the population, making our schools more diverse. Um, there was a question about um, money. And so, yes, when we lose a student to another district, we do um, have a per pupil um, you know, amount of money that is reduced by the state, but we do receive school choice, uh, a, a, a standard amount that the state calculates um, based on their um, calculations. And so we do receive income for every school choice seat that we filled. So each year we are required to vote to stay in school choice, to continue to have these options, and we are required to vote on the number of seats we make available to augment our current class. And those seats go, as Annie mentioned, to, um, are given away by lottery. Um, we do not have any uh, influence or pull in making that happen. Did I miss anything, Annie? Was that a good summary that it was. I will just, just clarify one thing. The vote is to participate, always to accept. A public school district can never prevent a resident. So even if Hadley chooses not to participate, Hadley residents always have the option of exercising choice outside of Hadley. The vote is always on the accepting side of, thing, of things. And, and there and, are many towns that choose not to do exactly that. Like choose. Longmeadow is a town that has a very high per pupil expenditure and they choose not to uh, have yeah. any students coming in. Um, we choose to make our seats available and we do receive some income as a result of that. And uh, that's, that's uh, correct. That's and great. as, as we saw in the equity dashboard, school choice is really an engine of diversification in our district and something that's very important to us. Indeed. So um, that said, I'm going to uh, call on Christine. Christine, you have a question. Uh, the only question I have is, are those numbers reflective of students who are already here by school of choice? Or yes. so, so there are. So I say to Jen, how many students were in, uh, are in first grade right now? And that includes everybody, resident enrollment, sitting in first grade, and school choice enrollment. Okay. Just was 24 kids. And so I just made them all go to second grade. And that's how we come up with what's available in second grade. Right. So just, just making clear that, you know, once somebody does choose to come, too Hadley for school of choice. They don't have to go through that lottery again. Um, Excellent the, point. People One may time. not know that. Okay. Correct. All right. So those numbers, uh, those numbers yes. also reflect um, where we're currently enrolling students. So whether our students right now that are um, leaving certain schools in in Hadley um, and our Hadley residents, they are coming. So that is may not be reflective of the students that are right in front, um, but we're, we're currently enrolling uh, several students at Hadley Elementary School. So that's just the anticipation numbers. So I just, I don't want a teacher to look at that and say, oh, I'm one off or two off, knowing that there are students that are, that are coming in the next couple of weeks. That's terrific news. Yep. I have a question before we vote. Yes. I know in past years we've had, um, I guess parents come forward and raise concerns about the number of students per class. And so I'm just curious right now if our principals are still um, aware and cognizant, checking in with teachers and making sure that there aren't certain grades that might benefit from a smaller class side, uh, size if it's a particularly challenging grade and paying attention to that still. Yes, we take that into account. Um, and that's why I think you see difference between um, Hadley Elementary School. We still are capping it out at 20, which is a, a fairly small size, I, I believe, um, per class. We're not going to get, let's say, for instance, right now in third grade going into fourth, you know, I, if I was a betting person, I don't think we're going to get 14 people to all register for grade three. But that's, I mean, the more the merrier, in my opinion, um, because our, our school choice students are very important to us. But we do look at the numbers 
we look at capacity, we look at how far students have come, different grade levels might warrant different um, numbers, so to speak. Um, but overall, you know, I, I'm confident in the numbers that we have or the seats that we're opening up. And we have constant con conversations with classroom teachers around, you know, how well their students are performing. We look at the data. We look at how well students have, have grown and growth for each um, grade level. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, we do have lots of conversations about what's our capacity, you know, what, what are our needs? Where do we want to be? Great. I could just say similarly at Hopkins, we don't have any concerns. We've had um, up to 55 students in previous years. It's just been a few years since that was the case. So we have the resources that we need and our grade levels are split between three teachers, not two teachers. Terrific. Excellent. Any other questions before we um, accept a motion to uh, approve these school choice seats? All right, do I hear a motion? So moved. Okay. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes, thank you. All right, moving on to the next item. We have the superintendent formative evaluation. Uh, Annie, thank you for providing us this document. Um, is there anything you'd like to say about it? before we dive in? No, uh, yeah, I'll, and I will take us through it rather quickly. Again, the school committee, um, I appreciate the way that we've approached this. In June, you will give me the required uh, ratings that are required by law that you give me every single year and an overall rating. The mid-year check-in, this is just an, a chance for the school committee to say, ah, oh, gosh, I really don't feel we're on track with that standard. So this is more of a, we've always treated this as kind of an on track, off track and haven't gone through uh, voting individual ratings for every standard. So in general, one of the things that we're working on under standard one is the review and revision of curriculum maps in every grade across the district. This really, the principals have done a phenomenal job in leading this work in their buildings. They provided faculty and staff with templates, with resources. You can see there's links to these things. You can see what they look like. And also um, in, in, in alignment with the values and the priorities that we've established as a district, they've encouraged teachers to integrate uh, standards that speak to social justice, that um, instructional units that include diverse achievements and viewpoints, and I've provided some examples for you. And at the same time, HES, while doing mapping across the board, is also implementing a new um, English language arts curriculum this year. Also in instructional leadership, uh, one of our priorities is to enhance and expand high quality college and career pathways. You can see that we have multiple pathway options. There's a link to that. That's also information that I sent out to parents recently. Um, we have been awarded this year alone, just over $150,000 in grant funding for pathways development. We have students who are enrolled in these pathways. You can see that we'll have 14 juniors and seniors who will complete 84 college credits in this school year. Um, we also were awarded a grant from the state to provide paid internships to Hopkins Academy students in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And we're in our second year of implementation of the future educators pathway. Um, also our priorities to expand technology, service learning and language learning. These are some goals that the school committee set out now a couple of years ago. Um, so some that are new will be, uh, looks like we'll have opportunities for paid virtual internships in cybersecurity and other tech career fields for students. Those will be through MIT and IBM. Um, we, are, we received seed funding for a teacher team to develop an innovation pathway in technology and information systems. We're developing, we have grant funding for, to develop service learning units. At the elementary school, students are receiving Spanish language instruction weekly. And it looks like this year, which is a big tip of the hat to uh, Jen, Dad, Jen Dowd and Ms. Um, Krishnan, our project lead the way teacher at Hadley Elementary. I'm fairly certain that we will be named a distinguished project lead the way uh, school, Hadley Elementary will this year. 
Um, but let's pretend I didn't say that so I can go on my June summative evaluation. Under management and operations, our goal is to implement a multi-tiered system of support and literacy and mathematics and social emotional learning in K through eight. And the good news is we are now, we have that underway in, grade, in K through 12. So that is, um, my evaluation is really all the hard work everyone else does. Uh, this is really our entire team, and certainly Michelle Watoitz is doing an incredible job of, of leading this work with the principals and in the implementation of an evidence-based social and emotional learning curriculum that occurred this year. Um, we piloted it last year and have implemented it in grades K through eight. Um, fostering a safe, inclusive, and equitable learning communities. I mentioned we have restorative justice professional development scheduled district-wide professional development and culturally responsive practices. I'm participating in something statewide called the Racial Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Professional Development Cohort. Um, our leadership team will be receiving professional development from Delino HR on civil rights training and investigating bias incident, incidents. And of course, we've had the good fortune of hiring Sarah. Um, lots of grants, good news there. Uh, we have written a uh, grant proposal to date totaling just shy of a half a million dollars in one year for a small town. So our proposals are at $478,000. Um, we have two in review that are sizable, a school security grant and another evidence-based practices grant. And we have one that was rejected, but 15 have been awarded and two are still in review and I'm hopeful for those. So we have $323,000 roughly in hand. The one that was rejected uh, it's important to point out, it was for a dishwasher. I'll be asking you for money out of school choice for that. It was a stretch um, because I went under a like a school nutrition grant to try to get a dishwasher. Even the best writing couldn't get me there to really to thread the needle on that. And as we already talked about, the budget uh, that we presented is being recommended at this point by the town. Um, so a list of ways that we've been trying to gather input from parent and families, and we're really excited about the surveys that we'll be sending out, but we have a, a number of examples of consistent and um, ways in which principals are always asking parents for feedback, uh, grade notification, how they wanna be notified, how frequently, um, input on school safety, equity action plans, handbooks, open house and parent conferences. Uh, and our priority of collaborating with community partners, this is named on our strategy document in the select board, and our town to um, implement major capital projects. So you can see, thank you to the town for funding these. So we successfully advocated and thank you to the CPA for funding, uh, approving funding for the second part of the fields renovation project at Hopkins. In professional culture, we want to improve the effectiveness of data teams. We talked with you this evening about how we've used the data dashboard to engage with faculty around um, ensuring that we have equitable access to equitable access to high quality learning experiences for all students. Um, and we have done a lot to improve the skills and the depth of skill and knowledge of our faculty as they work in data teams. And there are some examples of what happens at these data meetings for you to take a look at. That again, reflects the high quality leadership of the entire district leadership team. The principals, Michelle and Celia, done a phenomenal job. And um, positive culture by seeking staff input. There's some examples of the various things we've asked staff to give us input about. And um, we've used their input, we've integrated their input in the decisions that we make and some of the curriculum planning groups that the staff participate in. And that is our midpoint check-in. Thank you, Annie. Let me be the first to say that you are on track for your, uh, for your mid-year review. And um, I, uh, I really appreciate seeing evidence in every one of these areas of initiatives that you've led in the last uh, year. And so I'm, uh, I'm I'm very appreciative of the ongoing work that you're doing to excel in each of these areas. Um, I wonder if my colleagues have any other comments for Annie on this. Just thanks for all the hard work you do, Annie. 
It's a gift. Outlettering. Outlettering the same thing. Um, it's it's um, always amazing when it's always put down in front of you like that to review just how much a small district is able to accomplish. I think it's wonderful. Um, and I think the really exciting thing for me is that I feel like a few meetings ago, we had just mentioned how hard it is to, you know, excel in that community engagement and um, category. And I'm really excited about the panorama surveys. Um, I'm really excited about not only is it community engagement in several ways, but I'm hopeful that it's engagement that will provide some meaningful information towards the school's um, beliefs um, and what we're looking to do here with inclusion. So I'm really excited about that in particular. Thanks. Thank you. I'll I'll echo everything uh, that's been said already. I, I guess other than the the dishwasher, Annie, is there any? Because there's a lot of wins here. Other than the dishwasher, is there anything that you are looking forward to still kind of getting sinking your teeth into the second half of the year, or anything you still like to 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 accomplish? Not just the second half of the year, but uh, the first thing that comes to mind are the disparities that we saw in the equity dashboard. And I'm really eager with members of the team, with the faculty and the student representatives that we have here over time, looking at that and asking ourselves, what do we see and what does that mean? That's really important to me. And um, yeah, that's probably the the biggest thing. And uh, and working with the entire team to uh, to just keep doing good work and moving forward. And I would say the only major wash it, loss is that dishwasher. That's really, that is my... <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. We'll spring for it out of school choice. That's all right. right. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you, Annie. You don't need us to vote on this. Uh, nope. That's the final assessment. That's Very point. good. Well, thank you for, um, for, for this midpoint review. Appreciate sure. it. Okay. Moving on to the uh, item G, I guess, replacement of Hopkins Acad uh, Academy. No, sorry, Hadley Elementary School dishwasher using school choice funds. So you need a motion to buy a dishwasher. How much will it be? I'm requesting up to $75,000. The quote that we got for when we put the grant proposal together was about 67,000, I think. So I just want to give us some wiggle room that the quote was from a couple of months ago. So. Okay, is this um, the kind of dishwasher that uh, I used to use at Smith College when I washed dishes where you crank it up and like put yes. it through and like within three minutes, your your dishes yes. are done and dry? That's what we would like because that's what we need to have happen. Yes, that's the reason we'd like a new dishwasher. So that is the goal. Yes, that is that's the terrific. Yes. Those things are amazing, very efficient. And uh, it, it keeps us, yeah, It I, I think... Uh, we, I'm, I'm definitely in favor. Um, they're amazing. Okay, so um, do I hear a motion to approve the purchase of a dishwasher? So up moved. To five thousand. So moved. Okay. And do I hear seconded? A second? Seconded. All right. Terrific. And all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Motion passes. You have your dishwasher. Thank you. <laughs> Did you we will be very, very happy about that. It helps us. We've gotten rid of all the plastics. So we're all into silverware now. So that, Such great that's, a, news. that's a big win. So thank you. Yeah, that's a big win for our environment too. So thank you. Did you vote this? I'm so sorry. Did you vote the school choice? Uh, did we vote that? You did. Okay. I, I mentioned that it was coming out of school choice, but no, I'm sorry. That is school choice slots. Oh, uh, I, yes. a first and a second and a perfect. Yes, I just yes. recorded, but it's recorded on the video. Yes, okay, no did. thank you. No problem. Um, item H, Town of Hadley Energy Reduction Plan. Annie, do you want to say a few words about this? Certainly. So we have seen this before. You wrote a letter of support as the school committee. I know that Mimi's here if there are any questions. I've linked the energy reduction plan there, and I believe that this is the final step in the town being designated a green community, which is something that's been very important to the committee that's been doing this work. And they need a vote from the select board and a vote of support from the school committee. And certainly maybe if I've missed anything about what you need, um, feel free to chime in. Um, I believe that's everything because you already um, adopted the fuel efficient vehicle policy. 
Yes, we did. So this is it. Yes, just adopting the energy reduction plan. Terrific. Well, Mimi, we're excited about um, about supporting all green initiatives. In fact, our school is doing separate um, evaluation as to whether we can bring on additional green technologies to offset some of the school uh, use of fuel, fossil fuels. And so uh, this is completely consistent with our goals as well. And I, I'm very pleased to put my support behind it. Christine. So how does that affect our plans? Does it in fact, does it affect it at all? Well, I, I read through it and it didn't seem to put any limits on what we could do. It was just simply making a statement about what is possible in terms of green energy, but maybe maybe you can clarify that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so once the town is designated as a green community, you become eligible for first um, a designation grant, which is that one's actually automatically provided by the State Department of Energy Resources. I think it's going to be about 135 or 140,000 for Hadley. Um, and then the town decides, well, um, along with the schools, decides which projects you would want to do first with that funding. Then once you've expended those funds, then the next step is to apply for competitive grants. And you can get larger amounts of funding through competitive grants um, than the original designation grant. Um, it primarily pays for energy conservation measures, so energy efficiency. It can pay for some renewable energy. It does not pay for solar. Um, and it, and Certain things it doesn't pay, it doesn't fund like new windows, solar, um, but there are many, many projects that it will fund. Um, and often um, schools are the biggest energy users in town. Um, and you can really save a lot of money by um, you know, implementing energy efficiency projects in the schools. There's, there's a number, if you looked um, at the the audit that was done and projects that were scoped out, possible projects, there are quite a few at Hopkins Academy in the um, elementary school. And and by the oh, and so also you're not you're not committed to doing any of this. So this is um, the goal is to reduce municipal energy use by 20% over five years, but the town is not held to that. It's an aspirational goal. And you can also go beyond that. Of course. Yeah, I think the the key question was, uh, would we would this prevent us from moving forward as we wish to on our uh, energy efficiency plans, which are not voted on yet? We're investigating that uh, we have a, a furnace and boiler situation to replace, and we're looking at heat pumps. We're also we have a roof to replace. We're looking at solar. Uh, so. Your questions help clarify that we are not prevented from moving forward on any of those potential plans. In fact, the designation as a green community would allow us to apply for funding uh, to offset some of those expenses, not solar, but heat related. I noticed that Hadley Elementary School is one of the biggest hitters here in electric consumption on table 3A. Um, so far and above any of the other buildings. So it makes a lot of sense that we be uh, we be considered as a one of those projects to uh, support from the town's perspective. I also noticed that Hopkins Academy does not have electricity um, amount consumption outlined in the document. Um, yes, yeah. So one caveat is um, in... I took over this project from the person who was working on it previously. There was confusion um, with some of the accounts. And so the electric account for Hopkins Academy had not been entered into the database. And unfortunately, it was entered weeks ago, but it takes the utilities a very long time to start populating that data. So I am waiting, we're still waiting to get the full data showing the baseline energy use. And one of the key accounts we're missing is Hopkins Academy electricity. We're hoping to get it from Eversource any day. 
Um, I'm sure we'll have a complete picture of all of the energy used by the time we submit this application to the state at the end of the month, <clears throat> at, the end of at the end of March. But at the moment, yes, we don't actually know what the energy usage is at Hopkins Academy because we're missing the electrical use. Being an older building uh, and you know rivaling the size of the elementary school, I imagine that that is a, an even bigger energy consumer than the elementary school. Um, but yeah. I look forward to that data being updated when you have it. Are there any other questions about this um, document before we vote to uh, approve uh, and, and lend our support to Hadley becoming a green community? Okay, do I hear a motion to approve this uh, proposal to, let's see, it's the Town of Hadley Mass Energy Reduction Plan. Motion approved. Okay, Second. I can do it. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Terrific, motion passes. Thank you, Mimi. Great, thank you, everybody. All right, have a good night. You too. All right, we're moving on to the first reading of uh, a set of policies. Ethan. Yes, uh, tonight we are doing the first reading of uh, the library selection and weeding and also the request uh, for reconsideration, which goes along with it. Um, and just as a kind of an aside, the, this policy is being updated to reflect some of the conversations currently going on in the country around books and other media in school libraries. And this policy simply just outlines the process for selection of books made by the librarian. Um, in accordance with the Library Association, you'll see on the, the form that you guys have, the, the Library Association's Bill of Rights, um, that will guide the decision-making and explanation of why the process of weeding or reevaluation exists. Um, and then of course, there's the form that people can fill out uh, if they would like a book or media to be reconsidered. Terrific, thank you. And this is just a first reading. So we have some time to look at it, review it, and then we'll come back uh, next month to um, to discuss it. Any Any thoughts or comments from the committee members to add to that before we move on? To the library, off the library. Okay, terrific. Uh, and I'll and I'll just add. I guess the third one that you see there is just the the current policy that we are updating. Awesome. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you for bringing that up. All right. Um, item number five. We already had school uh, student representative introductions. So thank you again to our two new student reps. Um, the Item six is business manager reports, and we do not have Chris um, today, but we will see him in March and we'll get an update at that time. School committee reports and discussion, finance. Um, as y'all heard earlier, uh, the first meeting of the tri board will take place on March 13th. Um, I likely will be out of town. If there is a Zoom option, I might be able to attend Annie, um, but uh, if not, I thank you for uh, attending that with Chris. Um, CES, Tara. Okay, so um, we had our last meeting um, in the end of January, and I had sent out um, an email giving a little bit of highlights as well as the executor's report, executive director's report, um, and the um, CES annual highlights. Um, so I just to kind of refresh, cause I sent that quite some time ago now. Um, so one, you can read through the CE, uh, the CES executive director's report. I won't highlight all of that. It's a pretty long document that kind of goes through um, anything noteworthy that he finds to bring up each month. Um, the second is something I also attached. That's the annual highlights from 2022. If you haven't had a chance to review it, it's a really nice document that allows you to see um, what CES is doing throughout the year. So it just highlights their accomplishments and what they're doing as a group um, for our area. Okay. And so it's just really helpful to see, especially if you're not quite sure what CES is, is up to on a regular basis. And it's neat to kind of see what they do every year. Um, one thing that I had mentioned on there is that um, the director, Todd Gazda, will be doing, actually should have started, and I was unable to make the first one, unfortunately, um, 
but he's hosting educational sessions on the radio, WHMP radio. And so it's kind of neat each month um, he'll be doing, um, or every other week, I think, um, he'll be um, bringing in different kind of guests and talking about different topics that might be useful um, for people, just kind of educating about different areas that CES works in um, and just trying to share and get the information out there. Um, the latest financial report um, that had been reviewed, the are going to be working on the money that they have currently, they're going to be working on um, updating their buildings, um, mostly updating <coughs> areas of the public. So areas that people will go into the common rooms, the conference rooms, making it more um, more welcoming and inviting. It's been quite some time is my understanding since they've been updated. Um, I'm excited about this um, for many reasons. One, I have never um, stepped foot in one of the CES buildings. Um, we did not have a meeting this month. The next one will be in March um, and it'll be a hybrid meeting. There are people that come from quite far away in Franklin County that just cannot simply make that trip, especially if the weather's not great. Um, and who knows in March <laughs> right now what that'll bring. Um, but for myself, being close by in Hadley and the meeting and being in Northampton, hoping to be able to attend that in person because I have not been able to meet um, any of these representatives, although I, I know some of them, you know, outside of the committee um, in person, um, including including Todd and the other CES um, representatives that are there. So I'm excited to be able to go next month and meet everybody in person. Um, it's one thing to see each other on Zoom, but it's a nice to be able to meet them in person and have a conversation that way. So I will report back in, I think, I forget when the meeting is. I might be able to report back on that in March. Um, if not, then in um, April on how that in-person went um, and we'll know more if those are going to be in person here on out or not. Um, so again, um, nothing this month. That's all from last month. And then I'll report back in March. Thank you, Tara. Appreciate the report out and um, the their building is sorely in need of an update on that first That's floor. I'm glad, you, I'm glad <laughs> you get to go to it and um, help approve that to happen. All right, um, moving on to policy. Um, Christine, is there anything other than the library policy to talk about? Uh, yes, we reviewed the uh, bullying prevention policy and uh, the only, um, we're gonna have a first reading, but really the only thing um, we talked about was to update the language um, that defines cyberbullying and what it, is, uh, what it is and give examples um, of the types of activities um, that constitute cyberbullying. Uh, so it, it'll just update, uh, like I'm trying to see, so how it can occur, um, why cyberbullying is a bit different than regular bullying, um, in the fact that it's persistent, meaning 24 hours a day and permanent. So it's just giving a little more information. Cyberbullying is a thing. I'm really oh, yeah. glad that we're modernizing our bullying policy to, uh, to be comprehensive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Moving on to item D, fields. Um, Paul is not here, nor is Chris, who often has uh, uh, additional information. Annie, is there anything to know about fields? It know that it's moving along smoothly. We heard from Berkshire Design today and Paul can certainly provide a detailed update in March. Wonderful, thank you. And back to you, Christine, for capital. Nothing to report so far. I'll let you know. All right, great. Um, and we have, um, we're moving into announcements. Um, poor Joyce tried and tried and tried to connect in, but I think she just had connection error issues with her computing device. And I don't know if the person who's labeled iPhone is Joyce, uh, that she was able to get in on another device. So I'm just going to ask to unmute and just see if it is Joyce, go ahead and please unmute yourself so that we could hear from you. Hi, yes. <laughs> Oh, terrific. Well, I, I, 
I got in on my iPhone. I could not get in on the computer. For some reason, it kept rejecting me tonight. So anyway, I, oh, I was feeling rejected in the beginning there, but I did catch on. I said, I'm just going to use my iPhone. So I did was able to get on shortly after that. So I heard, I've heard your whole meeting. Um, very impressed with everything that everybody is doing. Um, I enjoy listening to your meetings and all the work that's being done. Uh, I do want to chime in on um, Dr. McKenzie's evaluation. I think that she's doing a fabulous job. Uh, I feel really grateful that I have two very strong women uh, that are running our town, my administrator, Carolyn, and Dr. McKenzie, who is at the helm of the school. And I just uh, really feel that uh, we have a good concrete we communicate and um, uh, I'm very happy that uh, she is still with us and we continue to roll along and have her direction so uh, thank you Annie I appreciate everything that you do thank you Joyce thank you you're here uh, we we only have um, for this week we only have uh, uh, we have a closing of the town warrant and I believe that everything there was nothing that we actually needed from you for Springtown meeting. Um, budget has been finalized, so all of that is good. So that's the only thing that we're closing uh, town meeting warrant on Wednesday. Um, other than that, I don't have much else to offer unless you have anything for me that you want me to bring back to the board Wednesday at my meeting. Um, I certainly will have people revisit the things that you have put in this evening uh on your uh felt that your um uh, let's see the uh equity dashboard was very interesting and hopefully they will take a look at those uh charts and things like that so i will bring that up to have uh townspeople take a look at that terrific yeah. thank you and if you could express our gratitude for um putting forth the school budget uh as um as, as we put forth, uh, we're, uh, we're truly appreciative of that support. Um, and also the, uh, the climate, um, the, the designating our town as a, as a green community, I think that that level of support will really help us. Uh, um, and thank you for voting on that tonight. Uh, I know that was on Jane's most mind before she headed out of town uh, last week. So thank you for taking that up tonight on short notice or maybe it was on your agenda to begin with but we appreciate it before a uh, town meeting so thank you you're welcome yeah no we added it uh it was a late addition but it much welcomed addition thank you thank you too and um stay safe tonight i gotta get up and go to work tomorrow morning so <laughs> be safe be i'll safe. be brushing my car off <laughs> yes all right thank you joyce thank you so much also have a good night Good night. All right, moving on to other announcements. Uh, do any of my school committee colleagues have any announcements? Okay, I have one. And that is, um, we have uh, the Hadley um, Learns small grassroots group that we are, um, have uh, um, just are sa saving the date for an April 13th uh, event. Um, and so our February event was on the topic of uh, the killing of Tyree Nichols in Memphis and uh, sort of holding space for community members to talk about uh, what happened and um, how a police stop could lead to that. And uh, we um, uh, overwhelmingly the support to learn more was, uh, was uh, evident. And it turns out that we have a nationwide, uh, nationally recognized uh, author and professor on the topic of um, police stops who is uh, teaching at UMass and lives in Hadley. Uh, it just blew my mind that this was the case. Um, it's Professor Kelsey Schaub, and she's written the book, Suspect Citizens. Um, what, I believe it's, uh, what 10,000, 
hang on a second, I want to read this to you. What 20 million traffic stops tells us about policing and race. Um, and so there's the book, there's a couple of op-eds as resources, and we're extending the invitation. This is an in real life event that we hope to hold at the library with the library's participation. So that would be Thursday, April 13th, 7 to 8.30, a community conversation. We've extended the invite to... Um, to police officers, uh, Lieutenant Cook, who was at um, Coffee with a Cop, uh, was ha uh, happy to hear about that event. And uh, as many of you know, Mike Mason has participated in Hadley Learns um, conversation and dialogue, uh, both at our events, as well as in our um, email newsletter, um, uh, email sort of community listserv, if you will. So we're looking forward to this event and I urge anyone who's interested in um, discussing uh, what Hadley can do um, around these topics, uh, please do sign up. You can go to hadleylearns.com and go to the events section for more information on that. And that's it for my um, announcements. Uh, let's see, the third item on this announcements section is upcoming events, Hadley Public Schools calendar. Annie, is there anything to point out there? Yes, so you heard it first. Tomorrow we will have a snow day. I talked to DPW earlier today. So tomorrow schools will be closed. Um, and uh, what's important to know is that we will not, Jen, you're still on the call. You probably figured this out. Um, we will not, tomorrow we were scheduled to have a delayed start early release for collaboration. So that day will just be dropped. So I don't want parents thinking it moves forward. We'll just drop that. And uh, again, I spoke with DPW and we will not be in school tomorrow. Great, thank you. And you'll send out notice of that tonight rather than tomorrow, terrific. Thank you. Very good, thank you so much. I could just tell there were some happy people in the Percy household, so. <laughs> I don't know about happy, that means kids are home tomorrow. <laughs> I wasn't talking about the adults. <laughs> true, true. All right, moving on to item nine, we have action items. Uh, we have to approve the minutes of the January 23rd, 2023 school committee meeting. Do I hear a motion to approve those? Motion approved. Second. Right. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, terrific. Um, we need to approve the warrants for January, 2023. Do I hear a motion? So moved. And a second? Seconded. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Approved. Uh, we've already approved preschool tuition rates.